Good morning, everyone. I am Stephen Drew from the Architecture Social, and today I am joined by a very special guest, uh, David Drews, who I've known for a few years. David Drews, who is Design Director now at Allied London. David, hello. How are you? Hi, Stephen. How are you doing? I'm all right. It's a bit of a crazy week, isn't it? Good thing we're going to be on audio because I wouldn't want to see the viewers to see my hair right now. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, it's professional hours. I can see you're in the office right now. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. The show mm. the show goes on, obviously complying with all safety requirements and everything. But we're we're in a new world. We're in a new world. So David, for now I know you, but for anyone out there who has not heard of you at all before, do you want to give us a little run through of who you are, what you're about and where you're at right now? Okay. Uh well first of all, thanks for inviting me to take part. Uh it's uh yeah, I was looking forward to it. Um Great. Uh, so I am design director at Allied London. I've been in this role. I've been with Allied London now for five years this month, actually. Uh, I previous to that, I was a project architect, um, and I worked alongside uh, Grant Jarvey on the pre the last project before joining Allied London uh, with Grant Jarvey, who was the project manager on that project, and then he subsequently joined Allied London and became managing director, and then uh, I joined him basically because we work really mm. well together um and my role now at allied london is uh, sort of twofold uh one part of the role is managing external projects so all of the large development projects that we have in manchester the architectural projects is about um well there's three large active projects at the moment and there's many more in the pipeline but um there's a sort of separate design team on each of those projects. So that's working with three separate architects. Um, and then the other half of my design, uh, sorry, the other half of my role is uh, managing the in-house design team at Allied London, which has, Great. we've kind of created since I've been here. Really interesting. And so for anyone, because anyone listening, that's not familiar with Allied London as well. So my understanding is, so Allied London is quite a prominent, successful property developer um in, in in and it was done some really great schemes in particular in manchester now you've got an in-house team and you, you're doing all this amazing stuff but perhaps maybe a more official explanation on ally london hopefully i've done it justice hmm. but it would be great to hear your thoughts on um maybe you can give us a quick summary on yeah. Allied London. Okay, so I guess Allied London's best known project in London, uh, for those of who are listening who are in London, is uh, the Herbal House development in Clerkenwell, mm. which was the, uh, the former print works for the Daily Mirror. It was built in 1929. Uh, it was the first project that I worked on when I joined Allied London. And yeah, for anybody who can is in that area, it's definitely worth a look. It's uh, yeah, been fully refurbished, recreated. Uh, uh, another two floors on the top uh, the reception space in and of itself was the first project that I ever kind of did here at Allied London and uh, yeah particularly pr- proud of that one um, over and above that although we're called Allied London we've got a lot of work that we do in Manchester so mm. Spinning Fields is a whole neighbourhood in Manchester which is the, like the financial district and you could compare it to Canary Wharf and scale and types of businesses uh, and it's now complete in terms of architectural developments um and we've been working on for the last at least five years since i've been here well, probably well beyond that uh st john's development which is the kind of adjoining neighborhood which is going to be much more media tech focused and it's kind of coming right. out of the ground right now Amazing. Wow. So that's where it gets really interesting because so in terms of what I do, so we've known each other many years before and currently we work where you're my client. So please don't find me. Um, <laughs> but we've, we've known each other from the architecture circle for many, many years. So and not in a typical recruitment sense, it's probably a shout out to our dear friend Naomi. I'm not even sure if Naomi listens to these, but Naomi, if you're listening... You're she the best. Know. Yes, she will. She will. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get a year full about this. Hopefully, we can do Naomi justice. But Naomi is a friend of mine who I actually met because at the time she was working, she was doing uh, recruitment for senior roles in terms of architecture. Because Naomi's done a lot of experience, and Naomi 
right now is in Canada. She's flipping property. She's an old friend of ours. But basically, she worked alongside you in the industry, mm. right? Yeah. So I know. So it's like he's um, what's it? Five degrees of Kevin Bacon or what have you? The architecture circle. Right. Sometimes it never ceases to amaze me. But can you perhaps you can give me a flavor of of all that time? Because what what's amazing is that now you're a design director of a large successful developer which a lot of architectural professionals that is a lot of people's goals and we can talk about and it would be really good to hear thoughts about transitioning from quote unquote mainstream architecture to working in house for a developer but maybe you can tell me a little bit about the naomi era so mm. was that when you were younger in industry and you were learning the ropes and she was there with her with her I don't know. You know what she's like. She gets mm. things done. She's got her own style. Yeah. Well, it would be great to hear. I like that, the Naomi era. Um, yeah. So I worked with Naomi on my first ever job out of university, uh, as in first full-time job after graduating. Uh, and that was for who previously Nuncombeck and Marshall, and then later they separated and became it became Stephen Marshall Architects that I worked for. But yeah, that was my mm. first role. It was really exciting. I still remember arriving in London the first time and getting out of the taxi at the Gainsborough Studios, which is where they were based. And uh, yeah, Naomi was there. She was a little bit older than me and she was kind of like a bit of a sort of mentor uh, figure to me. Um, and then we became friends. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really interesting that you bring that up because it, kind of like I remember that feeling of being a part two student and yeah not really knowing where everything was going <laughs> you, you've got no idea where it's going at that point right or, or maybe yeah. or maybe some people do maybe some people have got more of a kind of like career trajectory in mind at that young <laughs> age but I certainly didn't uh, I was wow. just really excited to get work and to be coming to London and you know what I mean it was on I was on like a relatively low salary but I thought it was a massive salary at the time and I was just really excited about it yeah I remember that era was well, similar for me. I remember when I, when I got my part one role, due, it was during the 2009 recession and I felt like I was given a gift from God. I felt so, so privileged. And I had the same thing. You, you kind of rock up to the office and I was like, I don't know anything. I'm really glad to be here. You know, and you just, you'll, you'll do anything. I felt like that, that guy who would run to the kitchen and make tea. Cause I'm so appreciative of it. And um, I still really, I love architecture in, in, in terms of that. But I, I tell you what, the more and more I do these podcasts, I, I think everyone has that feeling and I would challenge anyone. I think everyone at some point has had that feeling when they like, Oh, I don't know anything. And I, I think every now and then I get it sometimes where I think imposter syndrome is quite normal. You know, mm. sometimes you get caught up. It's like that moment and you're like, how did I get here? Mm. What? How, you know, and you can, you can, you can kind of doubt it, but um, no, you've done really well. So you did, you did all, you did several years, but you're so in, in industry as well. And, and forgive me, but you, didn't you work at, is it TP Bennett? Is that correct? Yes. So right. uh, I guess I can give you a bit of a nut, nut describe it in a nutshell, because it's sort yeah. of slightly un, unusual what I did. So uh, working at Munkin, Beck and Marshall, I kind of realized that the, I was working on sort of kind of pre-planning work and my professional studies advisor at the time said you probably wouldn't get enough experience to be able to uh, sit your part three, which I was sort of just desperate wow. to get it over and done with. So I then moved to a company called Christian Garnet Architects. Uh, they're a great firm. Um, and uh, I did my part three with them, was with them for about a year and a half. Uh, and then that was when the, the recession hit, end of 2008. And wow. we were a firm of 12 people. And the day before Christmas, I think it was 2008, uh, eight of us got made redundant. Ooh, the, the day before Christmas. That's, exactly, that's the, yeah. That's, it was literally the day my... after the Christmas party. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's, I don't know whether that's the being objective. I'm not sure that's the best time to pull the plug. It's like, hey. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, Christian Garner is a great, was a great uh, boss, and he was doing what he thought was the best thing to do at the time yeah. uh, and giving us a chance to kind of prepare our portfolios over Christmas and also be able to enjoy the Christmas party without knowing you're going to get sacked. So I think that was the <laughs> logic to it. But, so um, you were... You were hungover, and then they were like, by the way, yeah, sorry, it's been it was, difficult. It was, it was dark. Yeah, it was grim. Um, and, you know, I mean, I've got a lot of um, sympathy for young people at the moment who are finding themselves in similar positions, you know what I mean? Because mm. 
when it when it happens to you and you've got sort of no experience of it happening before, then it's it's really scary. You know, I mean, not knowing what kind of how long the recession is going to go on, how long you're going to be in this position. Uh, but mm. I think now with the current situation we're in, I felt like that experience prepared me for this year. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, managed to get some contract work. Uh, stayed, right. managed to stay in employment, went into, a, did a lot of refurb commercial fit out at that point, uh, yeah. and then ended up working for Wells Macarith, who were based in Mayfair. Wells Macarith were an amazing firm. You know what I mean? It was one of my the favorite jobs I ever had. Uh, but I chose right. to leave. I ch- chose to leave in 2010 uh, to go and live in Spain, which was in like the worst sort of economic <laughs> situation I'd ever been in for uh, for a partner. You know what I mean? So for right. it was sort of career suicide if I think about it in hindsight. You know what I mean? I was really um, being led by my heart, not by my head, at that point. Um, right. And. Luckily, I ended up to, I managed to get work uh, for a small agency which did projects for Nike, and then uh, did projects all across of Spain and Portugal, doing Nike stores, Nike shopping shops, and then Barca stores and Barca shopping shops, and then that culminated in the 2013 refurbishment of the Camp No Mega Store project. So that was Nike's okay. biggest project in 2013 and it continues to be the largest football store in the world, I think, today. Um, wow. And at that point, uh, my personal circumstances were different and then I decided that it was time to come back to the UK because I couldn't see how I was going to kind of progress beyond that within in, in Spain at that time. That was when I went back to TP Bennett. I felt it was really important to get back into a traditional sort of architecture role and then that was when I eventually yeah, got the role with Ale London. Wow. Okay. That's, br- I mean, that was a really nice, what I like about that is, uh, as well, I appreciate your humility because sometimes, like you said, when you're in the moment, people can make decisions which feel rational and you look back, you might feel different, but the point was you got there and you persevered through it. <laughs> Let's touch upon briefly that maybe it's a little segment right now, because I think you hit the nail on the head that actually there's a lot of parallels with what you went through then and the current situation now. And so you're on it. We, we joke, I joke a little bit about the Christmas party because of just the timing but you're right maybe it was the nice thing to do because there's some point you know what you were saying is that um, your employer at the time he had to make the decision that unfortunately he couldn't keep people on staff and there's no good time to ever do it but what uh, what, what what i'm interested in is you at the time managed to find a bit of contract work and what would be for anyone listening now before we talk a little bit more about your career, anyone listening now that might have been made redundant or people feeling a bit cautious about the second wave or looking for a job, is there any quick bits of advice that you would give for anyone or things that come to the top of your head? Hmm. Don't read the news. Don't read the newspaper. <laughs> like I, I literally had to stop at that point because I, I, it, beca- I, it became clear to me that if I was to continue reading like the Metro on the Tube every day at that point, then mm. I was never going to get a job because it was so depressing what I was reading. And, you know what I mean? By doing yeah. that, I, was, I did get a job. You know what I mean? So it was kind of saying, okay, I understand that the situation is difficult. The numbers are against me. But, you know what I mean? There is work out there. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. And I think you're right, because even now I I was looking at the um, employment statistics or unemployment statistics, should I say right now. And if you look at that number, then you're right. You just kind of feel like I would just give up in terms of you'd feel like you'd give up. But uh, it was during 2009. I remember my friend who I I did a, a podcast with the other day, Will McDaniel, his answer to it at the time was to send a lot of CVs out. And so what we found is that a few people in the studio would send 20 to 30 CVs and that he actually sent three to 400. Mm. And okay, maybe they weren't as personalized at the start, but the point is he got an interview. And what I always say is that of course, there should be always a few practices which you love. So say now, if I always admired Allied London, I want to work there, I would write you a custom bespoke letter. Why? With a CV tailored towards Allied London. I just think right now as well, you have that. And then you almost have to, in my opinion, have a version where you cast the net a little bit wide. And you have maybe a more generic CV, especially when you're at the junior end and you haven't got the industry experience yet, where you 
approach companies that you maybe you don't know before. And then when you go for an interview, you learn more about them and then you get more engaged. Because if you if you're a graduate, I think you've got to be super open minded and almost go a little bit off the beaten track right now. You know what I mean? Because I think there's going to be a lot of people applying for fosters and partners is what mm-hmm. I'm saying. And, you know, uh, Stevens Marshall, smaller practice, that a lot of people might not have known about back then. And what I'm saying is that there's probably a bit more chance in terms yeah. of employment. So, OK, so you've got to be open minded and not read the news. Mm-hmm. So we agree on that. So we're, now we're going to go we'll speed the time back up, back up to T.P. Bennett. So you've done all that stuff and T.P. Bennett, great company as well. What I'd love to hear your thoughts on is moving over to Allied London. Was that um, was moving to a developer something you always wanted to do, David? Uh, no, but maybe the idea of going client side. So when I was working for Nike in Spain, so mm. I was sort of exclusively, I was like an account manager for Nike within the agency that I was working for. So my plot, I was, my projects were exclusively for them. And uh, at that point, I really did want to go client side and work for Nike. And an opportunity came up for that, which would have meant me going to live in Amsterdam. Uh, And at the time, I decided that I wasn't prepared to sort of put myself through that kind of foreign country experience again. Do you know what I mean? Knowing that I would have struggled to have ever learned Dutch to a level that I would have been able to kind of integrate there. Um, So this, this idea of going client side was, yeah, was definitely kind of like, the seed was planted at that point but i think it was during the time working at tp bennett that i kind of almost like formulated the idea of the job that i would like to have right uh, rather because i'd always just kind of taken the job that i could get Uh, Mm. and i think uh this is maybe where um yeah maybe where i wasn't as strategic as some people are or i didn't have the education around that about how to be strategic in terms of a career plan um Mm. So I kind of formulated it myself. I came up with the idea of like, I'd quite like to be in a situation where I am uh, managing designers uh, and, you know what I mean, nurturing young designers. Um, and then lo and behold, the, the opportunity allied opened up and that wasn't the role originally. The role I was originally kind of coming as a sort of design management role. Right. And then it turned into this role that I sort of formulated in my own mind, which was quite amazing, you know. I love it. And I mean, it was a testament to the, to the strengths of the projects that come out of Allied London. Clearly, a lot of design goes into it. And that's a really interesting relationship you talk about as well, because you're effectively on the client side. Uh, you work uh, for Allied London. Your whole role is to get awesome buildings out, which you do. I mean, the portfolio is amazing. Mm. And it's quite interesting in terms of managing external architects. Truly, your role in architecture, and now you see both sides of the coin as well, isn't it, where you've got all the constraints and all the stuff you know, but then I'm sure there are cases where there are examples where you can see an architect and you think you can do better, they can do better and you would encourage them. Mm. But at the same time as well, I'm sure there's been a few examples where you've, you've had to push the design along and what's it like um, manage it's being, whereas before you were that person, how does it feel to be on the other side of the table? Mm. Well, I guess uh, I kind of feel like I'm on, on on one hand, on the one part of the role I have on the <laughs> other side of the table, but on the other one, I'm not. You know, what I mean, I'm the one sort of like vying for the work. So yeah. that kind of helps to kind of ground it, if you know what I mean, because yeah. uh, my approach to that is always to be that I would never ask ask of an architect or of a design team something that I wasn't willing to do by my willing to do myself or something that we're not doing within our own internal design team do you know what I mean in terms of standards and uh, dedication to the project or or, or whatever um, and you know what I mean obviously managing mm. people is very different from being a designer you know what I mean and, and people don't you know what I mean in architecture, yeah. you're not taught how to manage people. So it really is a kind of, you're learning on the job. And that one is an ongoing kind of uh, area of growth for me. You know what I mean? I don't feel like I've kind of got that 100% yet, but I continue to try and sort of refine the way that I do that. And 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 what I would say is that, um, you know what I mean? You, you get far better results by building people up than by tearing them down. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I agree with that. I think that is so fundamental. And actually, I've learned that as well. And because I 
similar to yourself, there's a lot of my roles, especially in the last year or two, is managing teams. And you know, you work uh, across my team. So Stephen, he works on my team, everything. And it's been an absolutely interesting um, turn of events. And and what, what especially during, we're talking about the pandemic and everything now, you try managing a team. There is no, there's no book right now to say how to manage a team during coronavirus. It is absolutely new territory. And like yourself, I found that, now I'm much more confident in it, but actually managing people at the start, it is a task that no one, quote unquote, trains you for. And like in architecture school, I, there's so much that in terms of even my role now, like in architecture, from architecture school, you learn how to present, you learn how the credit gives me like the confidence to do this, to speak to people like yourself and have these really interesting discussions. But you're right, there's certain things in architecture school, such as some aspects of the business of the of architecture and um, management that maybe you don't get so much experience with and, and you have to learn. So I did a, a podcast just before this with my friend Alicia and she was talking about uh, architecture fees, you know, and that kind of aspect of it. And that's a, an example, David, as well. And you know, from both sides of working in architecture and now as well, you're a developer. The point is, it's very, there's a lot of things, even like such as in business of if you don't establish a good fee that you can do the work on or a good budget, then um, these decisions at the start can absolutely cripple your team, cripple things. And so I imagine what, there's been loads of examples that you've learned of, like you're saying, getting things right at the start or getting the right team and all these things that you're not you pick up over time by doing it but there's no one way to do it you learn over time right mm. yeah absolutely i think that's yeah go on sorry no please jump ahead jump ahead no 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 it's just i was just sort of thinking about this idea of that you know i mean i, I suspect there's some people who are sort of like more naturally gifted around like having or more business minded just naturally yeah. uh, whereas some people are more design orientated you know what i mean my because i am uh more design orientated i you know what i mean my business strategy is to do good design do you know mm. what i mean yeah. uh, and that I, i'll i trust that i'll that you can sort of fill in the other areas if you're, you know, I mean, your your main sort of core thing is 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 good. Yeah, well, I think it's like the Dyson theory, and that's where your design is so good. I think the design kind of stands up for itself, and actually, that's the point. Really good design um, stands the test of time, and I think that really is the difference between being noticed and not. And actually, if, I think in that sense, what you're saying. Uh, exceptional design, well built, well executed. Um, it kind of sets, it opens up the other doors, then, doesn't it? Because if the design's so good, then you know, from an architect's point of view, then your fees are better. Hmm. And you know, from your point of view, the, if if when Allied London, when Allied London uh, succeeds, so you mentioned a few projects earlier, then you win work on the back of that as well, isn't it? Because good design can make an impact. It, it gets yeah. publicized, it goes it goes the whole yeah. way. And yeah. you don't want to be known as the developer where the buildings fall down in a few years. Or like I joke, you know, I joke, I've got, oh, yeah, let's talk about it. I've got a leaky roof. I've got a leaky roof right now. And people, <laughs> I know you do some really good schemes, but with my scheme, people, you're letting me down. And this is the point of like, that is bad design. It is bad design. I'm sure at some point some decision was made, but basically when it rains like this weekend, I get I get rain coming in all the time. And you don't want to be known, David, as the leaky roof guy, but I know you're not. You, you're, you're safe. You, 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 your projects are good. But uh, let's talk a little bit briefly about as well. Um, because uh, what I liked about what you were saying earlier, you weren't seeking per se, like you weren't saying, I have to go client side. You were attracted to certain things off it. But the point was you chose Allied London because of the opportunity there. And we probably would be a good time to talk about this because I see a lot of people in terms of approach McDonald and Company, which is where I run the architecture team going, right, I want to go client side. And I'm like, okay, 
why, first of all. And there can be a few reasons. It could be because there's, I think there is a perception of, oh, it's easier. There's more money. And mm. I, I always, I almost giggle sometimes because I know the amount of work you do. I know the amount of work everyone does. And it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And, and you, you champion design, you steer design, but a lot of these roles you touched upon design management and stuff, you have to almost let go of traditional architectural responsibilities where uh, and that's what I, I sometimes challenge. When people say they want to go client side, I always say, are you sure you want to let certain things go? Because I imagine in terms of what your role is now, you and you you help steer in Island London and you get the design to the awesome point it is. But it's a very different role than what you were doing before at T.P. Bennett and Stephen Marshall and everything, right? Uh, yes. You know, I mean, I, I think... Although I think my role here is slightly different from what some of the roles that come up for architects and developers, where it's much more mm. sort of a design management focus. I'm, I am lucky that, you know, I mean, when I came here, I remember uh, the managing director saying to me, oh, you won't, you, you're not going to be drawing anymore. We're not going to give you CAD software. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be drawing. That was the what they said. And, you know what I mean? They still haven't got the CAD software off me. You know what I mean? I still am <laughs> drawing this morning. I just, I, I can't stop that. But um, <laughs> Good for you. There are, um, yeah, there are definitely roles where where you wouldn't be doing that. You know what I mean? And I do think that some people are, you know what I mean? Architecture is a hard profession. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And one of the things I was going to mention before was about uh, the you were talking about like design and people getting noticed because of design, but I think um, there's not enough credit given to delivery architects. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, mm. I think there's something really kind of like noble and um, satisfying about being a good delivery architect. You know what I mean? We, that's mm. something that we find here at London because we're very design led ourselves. We do kind of lead the design and often I'll lead the concept design myself, but um and, and my, I have experience of delivering as well, right? So my role at T.P. Bennett was a, as a delivery architect. And being able to make something real to build it is incredibly satisfying. And there is a constant stream of work for good delivery architects. Do you know what I mean? Because people always need them. Um it's very well said, actually, because I work with them. Um, so Adamson's Associates, they're really, really good. I work with Veritech as well. So shout out to them. They're listening. But you're right. that And and I had to work out, because I remember in, in terms of recruitment, I was like, what is an executive architect? Hmm. And this, I was like, it sounds like an executive producer. You know, what do they kind of do? And I know what you mean, actually, that, you know, a good executive architect, the point is, if you have this amazing idea, it's. It reminds me of this, like the Steve Jobs and the what's his name, the guy in in the back. The point is, Steve Jobs can have the vision, but you need someone that can realize it. And you, I, yeah, there is an art to delivering the projects. I mean, Renzo Piano designed the shard. Adamson's Associates made sure that thing stood up. And I kind of, I, I agree with you. I think that it's. Um, and but it's interesting you mention it because it's true. Sometimes it's almost like the back. The, the less publicized size of architecture actually isn't it exactly yeah and uh th- that's why i kind of brought it up because i feel like some some people probably get a bit bogged down when they're in that role i know i certainly did but what i didn't know then was that you know what i mean to become a good delivery architect it t- takes a long time do you know what i mean well to become a good architect it takes a long time but there's so much to learn that i think it's not until you've kind of got like a really sort of solid knowledge of all the kind of main areas that you can start to enjoy the role and yeah. you know what i mean if I, if I had to be a delivery architect today and that's something that i would be quite happy to do do you know what i mean mm. and, and that's what i want to say about people who feel like they you know what i mean they want to go client side is that you know what i mean there, there, there is a lot of respect and, you know what I mean, satisfaction mm. being a delivery architect. It's very interesting. And you raise a point as well, which I find is interesting, oh. that I think anyone starting out as well, I think it's so important to kind of see all REBA stages and try to and get a building from A to Z, or was it REBA stages one to six? Because the experience you get that, let's say hypothetically you do enjoy design stages more, so to someone out there, the point is, if you build things through construction, it informs your design so much because you know all the obstacles on site. You 
know the process and then you have a more uh, understanding of that point and that it informs your design mm. and i think as as well it's what i quite like is as you said that actually see there's some architects that are so innovative and in solving problems on site which is like an art form in itself yeah. but i think anyone is would you agree as well anyone maybe more in the junior stages or someone in their career it's in their part three or anything would you also advise to see uh, buildings all the way through or what do you think is like the best way to kind of bolster up your skills um so so as I, as I forgot one but uh maybe it sort of links back back to the previous point that like interestingly i think the people who are most likely to go client side are the ones who are in that kind of role like a delivery architect and they're very good and they get noticed by the client team for example do you know what i mean right so the irony is that if you're very good at your job and you're maybe even enjoy, enjoying it or you know what i mean have a sort of passion for it that's what's going to get noticed that's what's going to get yeah. noticed by people uh and so I would sort of say the same thing about the type of architecture or the type of work that people get into is that um, like follow what your your passion is, you know what I mean, within the field yeah. of architecture. You know what I mean? Because I remember doing the, the Nike stores when, you know what I mean, in the midst of this recession in Spain and thinking to myself when I was doing these sort of smaller shop and shop projects and thinking to myself, you know what I mean, that I was sort of being looked down on or that it was kind of less – you know what I mean, uh, prestigious mm. area of of my profession. But looking back at it, it was actually, it's, it's, again, it's really rewarding work. It's really fun. And, and I love doing it. You know what I mean? I really loved the sort of like, it was sort of fast paced and it was, like, it was a lot of creativity and you would see a project from start to finish within sort of six months. You know what I mean? So there was a real kind of satisfaction in that. Yeah, it's, I, I, thought, I thought it was really interesting what you said. The point is that, say now you work with an executive architect who's having fun or doing things and kind of solving problems and is working with you professionally and maybe you have a little laugh in there as well. The mm. point is, if you're going to hire someone on your team, and because you, you're effectively a hire manager as well, that's probably, that's probably the first person you're going to think about, isn't it? You're going to be like, Dave's good. Let's mm. get Dave on. Or, you know, Chanel, she's kicking ass. She's mm. a really strong architect. Yeah. And I, I agree with you that actually it's a really good point to make because obviously in, in, in terms of profession, being a professional, you, I think that if you leave a practice, you should always leave one a good on a good note is these relationships in terms of where you work is so important. And I love that analogy. The point is if you're enjoying it, I think it gets noticed and that's a really good point to make. Actually one probably if you're, if you, if you are interested in client side, then, you know, with the clients you work for, they should be someone that you actually want to impress. It's probably a risk, but I think it's a really good life lesson. I find that a lot of, um, my opportunity has come out through that as well. So I think that's really good advice. And obviously, and now we don't want to talk about the news data. We don't want to talk. We're not going to go on about the coronavirus. And I, I promise that's the last time I, I bring it up. But what I would like to say without being specific. So this month over this year, this year has been a stressful time for everyone right and there's definitely been some obstacles you've had to overcome but where i'm going with this is because you've had to adjust everyone's had to adjust i mean and we're still going to go through it there might even be a this might even continue but what's your kind of advice for anyone out there is it to keep going and power through things and adapt or any uh, words of wisdom Oh, uh, well, I guess, the, yeah, it's the one that I always try and come back to whenever, you know what I mean, there's a period of difficulty or uncertainty is just, you know what I mean, show up for work on any given day and do the best job that you can. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I found that that one always works for me, that sort of ultimately things will always sort of sort themselves out. But, you know what I mean, if I'm, my, my experience has been that hard work always pays off. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Well, it's a testament. I mean, the quality of buildings you've done kind of it says that. And sorry, I said there are no tricky questions, but then that was a tricky one because when I asked it, I was like, what would I say to that? <laughs> and I, <laughs> I, I feel the same. It, we're all kind of working it out as we go. And I think what I've enjoyed about this podcast and a few other things is that it's more about 
there is no code book for quote unquote your role. You are your role. You are learning it. You are every day you improve. Sometimes mistakes happen. People learn from it. I think that's what it's about. And I love your analogy of showing up because it's basically like right now, it's an ongoing battle, or I think of it like a marathon. And if you don't think of it like a marathon, it's, well, it's definitely going to be a marathon in the way this is going. You have to just keep going. Oh, what's the alternative? Just shrivel up and stay at home and watch Netflix and give up in life. Come on, we've got to go out there. Let's get the bell. We need to get out there. I think um, yeah, we have to, don't we? And it's, 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 it's difficult for me as well because in terms of artificial recruitment, I mean, we speak blunt as well. I mean, you, your role as well, you you know, it's great what you've done. At the same time, there's always difficulties there. It's not like you're ringing me up right now, unfortunately, although, David, do ring me up if you need <laughs> anyone of your team. And I, I promise I'll work, work in it extra hard. But, it, I mean, I've had to adjust as well. And um, it's it's been challenging for me because the different ways I've gone about recruitment, I've completely had to change because the market, and I mentioned one or two podcasts about this, where I try to uh, almost – uh, bring back the curtains on recruitment because now you've seen both sides of it and it's quite funny you know because recruitment is his own mad little world and oh let me rephrase that recruitment when, when you understand it there is a process to it but there's also the humanisms of it things go wrong things change things you know there's a lot of moving moving parts and you've seen both sides in that as well mm. and in terms of how i work in before what you would do is for instance let's pretend i met you five years ago or i met someone who was a bim specialist you would go out and you would find the right roles for them you would go and i would say David, I've met a Revit genius, or I'd say I've met someone with raw potential. I think they're amazing. Are you interested? And you'd go, yeah. But and uh, but right now it's very different, as in the employer has a lot more choice. And so actually the roles that I am working on, it's more from an efficiency standpoint from them. So yeah. it's, it's, it's completely changed. Because if you were a few years ago – like 2015 2016 and you were kicking ass and you were respectful and you you had done a lot of good projects i think you could walk down the road and you could get you know a few you'd be respectful but you would interview at a few places and you would get a lot of offers and right now it is completely the other way isn't it i'm sure you get a lot of applicants for allied you'd love to reply to them all but there's constraints that everyone is in right now where the first person that you have to speak about is your team adjusting. So it's a really stressful time for all, but th maybe it goes back to your advice before of uh, if you are someone looking, if you are an architect or a professional, you don't look at the news and keep powering on. Cause, but there are people that are getting jobs right now. It's not completely doom and gloom. It's just, what's the point we're saying? It's just, it's tougher, isn't it? You have to work harder you have to be more engaged. You have to turn up to the office. You have to keep powering through. It's difficult. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, I mean, there are people in a really difficult situations at the moment. I don't know. I really kind of, you know, I mean, have a lot of sympathy for them. Um, I, you know, I mean, what, what I would say is that it's, it's maybe a time for some people to, you know, I mean, uh, reflect on, on what they actually want to do, yeah. where they want to go. You know, what I mean, they start to define, you know what I mean? Like in, in the example of, of, of this role, it was there was a point where I got to where I was just quite frustrated with the, the work that I was doing. And then I was just like, actually, I want to do something like this, you know what I mean? Rather than just having to accept what was there. So um, th there is, mm. you know I mean, people do have time at the moment to reflect. And I think that's, um, there are people who are benefiting from that for, because it's a, it's yeah. a time like any, any other for reflection. Yeah, well, even a, a literal sense with me was that the architecture social was kind of my project from, uh, well, we joked about it, isn't it? Because I told you the truth. I was like, I'm part-time furlough. And, you know, at first it was fun, but then after that, I was just going insane. So and when I say hey, insane, or not literally insane, don't take me away or anything like that. But yeah. I, what I mean is that I needed, it's like the architecture output that we joke about, that I needed something to kind of get my teeth into. And I think that 
that. And I felt that it would be a good thing to, A, help students out, people can interact. And the ideal goal is that, say, you know, you have a graduate role at Allied London, and when it pops up, you can just post it there. Why not? It's good mm. for everyone. It's good for people in the industry. And, mm. you know, there's really good things that come out of it, such as a book club. But, yeah, the point is if I – if I didn't use that time in a certain way or I didn't want to do something, then um, yeah, I could have missed that opportunity. But what the other thing of what I would say is that there is no chance I would have had the time to set up the architecture social if I was still working full time at that time. So now I'm returning to full time next week. What's good is that the community is there and I will tap into it out of hours. And it's quite nice that the ball started going. But that project, there's no chance that I could have got it going because these things require momentum and they require a lot of time. And it kind of goes back to your point of, it was a pause of a moment of I'm going to do something during this time. So, I, I mean, some other examples, I've got some friends that, you know, they're getting back into their art. They're getting back into any, everything. Have you been just working flat out, kicking ass at Allied London or have you done anything well, nice? No, interestingly. So it's, I was just, what I was just thinking about when you were describing that, because yours is like a perfect, the perfect example of, you know what I mean? This period and, and this idea that like boredom is often the birthplace of creativity. You know what I mean? Oh, okay. Some people, you know what I mean? Because we're we're often always so busy, but it's it's actually when you kind of clear clear the space and you've got nothing to do that it's when real kind of creativity can kind of you know what I mean come out because you you need to find a way of entertaining yourself. Um, my experience in the lockdown has been that uh, the the type of the, the the way in which we work changed significantly. So uh, the sort of admin side or the more sort of business strategy side of my role. Uh, that sort of stuff quite quieted down a little bit. So I was then had more space to kind of focus on the design stuff. And and what I found is that during the lockdown period, I've produced some of them kind of some of the creative work that I've been most proud of. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really, really interesting. I was quite a nice note and uh, thank you. That makes me feel a bit better because you know, you get them, you get them times and I've, I've absolutely enjoyed it. And I've had a few people, um, I've, I've had a lot of really, um, good stories come out of it. I know people have got jobs, man, that really makes me happy and it's really worth all the time. But, um, Hey, it may be, I've been a bit easier to learn a bit of guitar. David. <laughs> <laughs> next time, next time we'll try not to, uh, do a Facebook or, uh, a, um, well, I think it's a bit more than that. But the architectural social, uh, I really do enjoy, and I f- and I really appreciate your support on that as well. So for me, I've quite enjoyed this chat as well. I think we've had a nice a cover. Uh, we've covered a few topics. I think maybe we can return down the line at some point. If you in, maybe we can, we'll talk about a particular. It might be nice to talk about if say now when Allied London's got a certain project coming up, then maybe we can we can go into it. I'd love to hear maybe a bit more of a we can do a little specific uh show and tell perhaps about talking about our project, talking about your process on there. But I just felt like for this first one, we, we kind of went into the deeps of it and then mm. we had a little nice little note at the end. So I I think wise words from you, it's a nice chance to uh, reflect. That's what you're saying, isn't it? And to change and to Absolutely. experiment yeah. before we gear up. So on that note, David, so where can listeners find you at the moment? I know you're on the architectural social, but mm-hmm. other than that, you're on LinkedIn and, you know, can you let us know where Ali London's website is and, and where you're at? Yeah. So I, I guess I'm on LinkedIn. You just need to go, if you Google my name plus RIBA, that's how you'd find me on LinkedIn. Um, uh, Allied London's website is www.alliedlondon.com. Mm. Um, the uh, the it design team portion of Allied London is www.studioheart.co.uk, uh, and we've also got an Instagram. So amazing yeah. amazing oh it's probably worth mentioning just before we go as well that me and you're actually not related are we i'm true and you're no. true <laughs> <laughs> we're not related yeah. i've never heard drews before though no, that's no, a no, new I get, one i get mistaken for a drew all the time so yeah. do you mm. do you 
Oh, there's my little alarm going. Oh, I'm put up. Sorry, at the end, there the alarm went off. We, I was, it was professional up until it, <laughs> up until the end. But that's fantastic. David Drews has been an absolute pleasure. I am, um, I've really enjoyed this. I absolutely admire all the work that you do. It's always good to work for you at uh, Allied London. And yeah, let's uh, let's watch this space. And I, your next building I want to know all about it thank you so much David speak soon thanks Stephen